unrecorded. <laughs> so I don't have to pay you any royalties every time I listen to you. I've got a couple of announcements for you that, we, that weren't mentioned. This coming Friday, the 27th, the 27th, the folks will have their house open to the lambs. The lambs are missionaries who will be coming. Cal, did you want to say anything about the lambs? As far as our church? Uh, about, you know, where we're considering um, having them as missionaries. Is, okay. uh, they came here one time. His uh, testimony was very convicting. It seemed very similar to something that uh, someone would relate to in this area. And then going to Thailand was just an amazing story with uh, So we want you to get an opportunity to meet the lambs, to interact with them one-on-one, -on -one, and it's over at the folks' home. The address and stuff is in your bulletin. It's going to be from 6 to 8 p.m. This is a, don't want to, you don't want to miss out on an opportunity like this because when you get a chance to meet a missionary, it becomes more personal. You can figure out how to pray for them. How can you help them? Would writing them a letter from you personally be an encouragement to them? Lois is shaking her head, Yes. Christmas time especially. Great, thank you. It's exciting for us because this is the first missionary that we've looked at supporting in I don't know how many years. But it's, it's exciting to, to be part of sending people out to other lands to proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ. Also in July, on Sunday nights, you're welcome to join us. We've been going through the book of Genesis. Tonight we're going to be talking about the beginning of all things. How has God's promise to Abraham have application to you and me? Does, something, does a promise God made thousands of years ago affect you and I today? Well, you come tonight and you'll find out. We're going to be finishing up with Genesis, and then we're going to draw our attention to knowing the Holy Spirit. Looking at God's Word and discovering and finding out what is the role of the Holy Spirit in your life, in my life? What are spiritual gifts about? Do you have one? Do I have one? If you have one, do you have more than one? What does the Holy Spirit, Spirit's work involve in drawing people to God? Who wrote, the Holy, who wrote the book you have in your hand? So we'll be looking at the ministries. We'll be looking at the person of the Holy Spirit. That's at 6 p.m. every Sunday night. And we'd love to have you come with us. And then afterwards, we go to Wendy's for fellowship, which is a highlight for the kids and the older kids. Inside your bulletin, there's some sermon notes for you to take out. Please take those out. There's a few fill-ins for you. We're looking at the purpose of patience, the coming of the Lord. Turn your Bibles to James, James chapter 5. Would you read along with me or follow along with me as I read? James chapter 5, verse 7. Therefore be patient, brethren, until the coming of the Lord. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, waiting patiently, for it until it receives the earth, the early and the latter rains. You also be patient. Establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is at hand. Do not grumble against one another, brethren, lest you be condemned. Behold, the judge is standing at the door. My brethren, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord as an example of suffering and patience. Indeed, we count them blessed who endure. You have heard of the perseverance of Job and seen the end intended by the Lord, that the Lord is very compassionate and merciful. But above all, my brethren, do not swear, either by heaven or by earth, or with any other oath. But let your yes be yes, and your no be no, lest you fall into judgment. 
We've been going through the book of James. James' main point to the believers is be doers of the word, not just listeners, but put into action what you're hearing. Don't be identified as a Christian in your, as a title, but be a Christian in action, in doing. Throughout this entire book, James has wonderful little things for you and I to call our attention to and to remind us that we walk with Jesus Christ. That walk influences us and causes us to be more Christ-like. In our conversation, in our relationships, in our work environment, in our friendships, in whatever role that we find ourselves in. James is pointed out and saying, brethren, believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, let's step up. Will you join me as we pray? Let me, Father, we thank you for, for the book of James. James reminds us many times that we need, we need to be called out. We need to be reminded of what our duty is and that our duty is a delight in serving you. You called us by individual names when you saved us. You asked us to come into your kingdom. You asked us to be part, to be part of you and that we have the privileges and we also have the responsibilities that go along with that. And one of those great privileges, Lord, that we have is to communicate to others that your son is coming soon and that he's already come once before and he came to die on the cross for, for all mankind, for you and me. And we thank you for that. And as we're thinking towards our future, we're reminded of missionaries and the, and the opportunity that we have to partake with them and getting that word out. And yet in our own area, in our own mission field that we have, we have that privilege of getting your word out to our coworkers, to their families. And we think of our own community with Vacation Bible School. We have a pr privilege of telling people about the good news that can change their life. Lord, we ask that you would open the doorway for many kids and parents to come. And as we are teaching the kids, may we also be mindful of the parents, for they are standing on the side watching and listening to what we're teaching. The world is hungry for your word. May each one of us take that responsibility to, to provide a fresh drink for all those who come. Lord, we lift up our leaders before you, and Lord, we ask that you would strengthen and encourage them. Help them to be men of your word by digging into your truth on a regular basis. Help them to lead by example. Of, how, of the things that you are working for, working in their lives, help them to work, work through those thing, same things and apply it to their children's lives. We pray for the leaders in our country. Regardless of their political sway, Lord, we lift them up before you and ask that they would seek your face, your wisdom, and the decisions that they're going to be making for the entire country. We ask you to bless our president, guide and protect him, keep him safe, and Lord, we also think, Lord, of the many churches that have gathered around this world today. Some have already dismissed and gone on to their, back to their homes. Some are just getting ready to, to attend their services. We ask, Lord, that they would have the opportunity to meet peacefully, without interruption. And we know and we recognize that that is a privilege that we have here in our, in our country. We are not concerned about the government coming in and shutting, shutting down your teaching. And yet, we know there are many churches around the world that are being persecuted, and we lift them up before you. We thank you, Lord, that the time that you've given to us on this earth is not for our own pleasure, but to bring you honor and glory. May the steps that we take today be the beginning or the continuation of our walk before you, that in everything that we say and that we do, that would bring you honor and glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Patience, who needs that?
Thank you for those small hands that came up. The rest of you that are already masters of patience, I need to hang out with you on a regular basis. Patience is one of those things that as soon as you think that you have it, you find out that you have a whole large area to grow in. Start off with thinking that you have patience when you are first married and you have to share your will with someone else. You're sharing a, a bathroom if you go to college with someone. All of a sudden, they make a big mess. You don't like a big mess. You like everything nice and tight and neat. But the other person says, I don't really care. It doesn't matter in the big scheme of life. It's okay if there's water all over the sink. It's okay if there's toothpaste smeared on the sink, on the handle, on the mirror. Patience. And then God brings you children. Now, either they are your children directly or indirectly, they're someone else's children that are dropped off for you to share the love of Jesus with. And you find out that it is so wonderful to look at these small little heads and these little bitty hands and say, you are so special. And then for them to turn around and go. <laughs> and you're discovering patience. My patience is wearing thin. It is the circumstances that you and I find ourselves in that tend to stretch out our patience, to test our patience on whether we actually have it or not. Circumstances which tend to fall directly down upon us, in which you and I feel the pressures of, do I have patience? You think of driving down the freeway and you're stuck in traffic. Right there, you have to exercise some sort of patience. Because no matter what you do, you can't push that guy in front of you out of the way, although you might like to. And the guy behind you is thinking the same thing. If that guy in front of me would just get out of the way, I could get somewhere. Or if you're standing in line at the grocery store, and it seems like nobody knows how to run a cash register anymore, and you're waiting, and you're waiting, and you're waiting. Or if you're standing in line at the DMV and you hear every other number called except yours. And just about when you know it's your turn, you watch the lady get up or the guy get up and go to lunch. James chapter 5. James says there's a purpose for patience. In James chapter 5, James is calling the Christian to patience. Christians need patience. There's three points that we're going to look at today. First, James wants to call, James wants to call our attention to having patience. He wants to call our attitude and look at our attitude during patience. And then lastly, we want to look at the application of patience. How do we apply patience to our life? Look with me down in chapter 5, verse 7. The word is, therefore. Therefore. Whenever you see that word, therefore, look what went before that word. Because James is going to give us the reason why Christians are called to patience. There is a specific reason you and I need to have patience. The first thing is because of the current circumstances that they find themselves in. The believers during James' time were under heavy persecution. They were being treated poorly. And therefore, we look at this first word in verse 7, and it says, therefore, and we circle that because therefore is reminding us to look, look up back in the context through verses 1 through 6, and we see that the believers at that time period were being mistreated. He says, come now, you rich, weep and howl, you your miseries are coming upon you. Your riches are corrupted and your garments are moth-eaten. Your gold and silver are corroded and their corrosion will be witnessed against you and will eat your flesh like fire. You have heaped up treasures in the last day. Indeed, the wages of the laborers who, mow, who mowed your fields, which kept, you have kept back by fraud, they cry out. The cries of the reaper have reached the ears of the Lord of the Sabbath. You have lived on the earth in pleasure and luxury. You have fattened your hearts as in the day of slaughter. 
You have condemned. You have murdered the just, and he does not resist you. The wealthy were taking advantage of the poor in James's day. James is not talking about an economic or a cultural warfare. He's just stating the facts of what's taking place. Rich people were taking advantage of poor people. And in the church, the church was filled with people who didn't have a lot of wealth. We face some of the same similar things today. And that people who have large amounts of wealth tend to think they can do what they want to do. Because they have it. They're entitled. I've got it. I can pay for it. I can buy it. I can run over people. And James says, gather a group of people together and protest. No. James says, be patient. Calls them to be patient through all of this. For the current situation that they're facing is not going to be the final situation. Look down with me at verse 7. Therefore, because of all the 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 oppression, the persecution, the injustice that are taking place. Therefore, be patient, brethren. He's not asking us to please be patient. He's giving us a command. Be patient. Hold in there. Because the future circumstances are going to change dramatically. You say, how do you know that? Because the prepositional phrase, until, that falls. Until the coming of the Lord. James says the reason for patience is that the Lord is coming. And when the Lord comes, everything is going to change. Perhaps you've had this at your own household. The kids are running around, they're a little bit out of control, they're playing, and all of a sudden they look at the clock and it's five or six o'clock, the time that dad or mom is going to come home. And so one of them says, mom and dad are coming home. Let's get everything straightened out. Because the rules are going to change. Their circumstances are going to change. The older brother or sister cannot really pick on and do what they were doing before because mom and dad are going to be there and they're going to adjust the overall circumstances. Three times James uses this idea for the believers here. The Lord is returning. Then again in verse 8, he says, For the coming of the Lord is near or is at hand. And then again in verse 9, The judge stands at the door. Hi, judges. Preparing to act. Therefore, brethren, be patient. For Christ is coming. Christ is near. Do not let your present circumstances cause you to lose your testimony. Instead, remember Christ is coming. What is patience? How does one define patience? Patience is to be long-tempered as opposed to short-tempered. When we think of, and we use that phrase, a person has a short temper, we mean that it does not take much for them to lose self-control. But what does it mean to have patience? A patient person is a person who can have all their buttons pushed and not lose their mind. There are some buttons that can be pushed by some of the most loving people in our lives And it seems to send us into a frenzy that causes us to lose our love, our consideration, our attitude towards them. Because they said, can you open the door for me? Because we said, can you do something for me? We've interrupted their life. Patience. Patience requires self-restraint. It causes causes us to refrain from retaliating. It causes us not to say exactly what comes to our mind right away. A perfect picture of patience is the farmer. James says in verse 8, excuse me, in in verse 7, he says, see, behold, look. See the farmer? The farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, waiting patiently for it until it receives the earthly and latter rains. The Christians call to patience, there's a reason for it, and then there's an illustration of patience. And the illustration of a farmer 
fits perfectly for the farmer does not have any guarantee of the work that he's about to do is going to receive any fruit at all. He hopes, he plans, he prepares, but he has no guarantee. James is talking about the latter, the early and the latter rains. For you and I, we don't think about that. We think there's one rainy season that we have. When does it rain in the Bay Area? There is a short season of rain that we get. Is the month of June and July a rainy season? You might wish that it rained, but it's probably not going to rain. In Israel, the farmer counted on the early rain and the latter rain. He's talking about the, he was waiting for the month of October, November for it to rain, and then from March to April for that rain to come. He was hoping, as he planted his fruit and vegetables and things out there, that, that he needs the ground to open up. So he needs the early rain to soften the ground. For the summertime, the land is parched and it's hard and you cannot plow through it. But once the waters start hitting, the ground opens up and yields itself to planting fruit. He also needs the latter rains to come to refresh the land and to provide what the seed needs to grow. He's waiting. After he's done his work, he sits back and he waits. Now, I wish I could tell you that's really what takes place in a farmer's life, because it doesn't. He doesn't go on vacation as soon as he's planted. He's out there looking at the field every day, looking for sprouts, looking, looking to see if there's any, any other problems. But he spends most of his time just waiting, waiting and waiting. He invests everything that he has in the seed, waiting for the first sign of life to come, waiting for the fruit to come. And after he first sees the first green stuff pop out of the ground, he is still waiting. Because he has no idea if there's going to be an unaccountable rain that comes through and washes everything away. Or if there's going to be a certain amount of disease this year that's going to wipe out his crop. Or if there's going to be too much sun or too much wind or too much weather that's going to cause all his work to be in vain. But the farmer waits. He's patient. Regardless of the circumstances that he finds himself in, He's waiting. The farmer is dependent on physical and the spiritual depend, or outcome of God. God has got to be involved in his work. And he's got to maintain an attitude of expectancy. He's expecting that he's going to have growth. That things are going to change. And the believer, you and I, are to be just like the farmer. We are to have an attitude of expecting things are going to change. To expect that God is going to use what are the circumstances that we find ourselves in for his honor, for his glory. Therefore, James gives us an exhortation to patience. He says, you also be patient. Just like the farmer, be patient. Establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is near. Be like the farmer. Wait for the fruit. Don't give up just because as you're looking out and you're seeing things aren't going your way, giving up and quitting. Be patient. Stay at it. Keep working. Don't resist. Don't give in. Stick to it. There's an old adage, once a farmer puts his hand to the plow, he doesn't look back. Because as soon as he starts looking back, his rows do all this. He says, keep his eyes on the forward and moving forward. That's the only way he can keep things straight. You and I, we've got to keep our eyes looking forward, not on what's behind us. Therefore, we are to establish our hearts. The idea of establishing our hearts means that we are to strengthen our hearts. We are to sure up the foundations of our hearts. Many times in, in the Midwest or even up in the Yuba City area, they'll have levees that when there's too much water coming down out of the hills, they'll, they'll be afraid that the levees might break. So they'll have to strengthen the levees. And they use sand. Sandbags. And they'll start stacking the sandbags all along the levee areas. The areas they think that there's a little bit of weakness to build up and strengthen, to prepare to keep that levee doing what it's supposed to do, holding in the water. 
There's other areas if you own land up in Northern California with the CDF, California Department of Fire, Forestry, excuse me, they want to make sure that your home has a fire break around it to keep it all clear, to protect the homes. Keep all the brush away to strengthen the ability to fight fires. What is it in your heart that needs to be strengthened so that you do not lose it because of the circumstances that you find yourself in? You don't lose heart. May I suggest to you that one of the areas is to look into God's word. Dig into God's word for answers, for truth, for encouragement. Look and search from his word and his word alone. Where do I begin? It depends on your circumstance. You may find the back of some Bibles, there are, there, there's uh, topics where you can say, here's what I'm going through. I need to find some answers according to these topics. Another thing you can do is just start reading. Read one of the Gospels. Read some of Paul. Read how God worked with the nation of Israel. Strengthen your heart. You will be amazed at how God can use the things that you are going through and what you're reading in your everyday life. Be patient. For things are going to change. When you and I were 21, and a few of you are not there yet, but when you were 21, you thought you had the entire world, right, in your hands. You knew everything. You could do everything. How has your perspective changed from the age you are now? Were you, patient to hurt, were you impatient in order to get things done? Did you want everything right away? James says, be patient. Because God has a way of working things out in such a way that he changes circumstances, he changes the events in life, and in the big scheme of things, in the big picture, Christ is going to return. And the fact that he is going to return should cause you and I to live a different way. Knowing that he is drawing near, knowing that his time is getting closer and closer. And that is the basis of our of our exhortation, knowing that he's going to be here, that his imminent return, is what it's called in the theological terms, that he could be here at any moment. Towards the end of verse 9, he says, the judge stands at the door. It's like looking over at the door and saying, there's the judge. He's right there, and as soon as he walks in, he's going to begin. We don't know when Christ is going to return, but we do know that there is nothing on the on the prophetic timetable that is stopping him from returning today. This could be the day that Jesus Christ returns. Are you ready? Are you ready to meet the Lord? The believer at James' time, during James' period, the first century, they knew and they believed that Christ could return at any moment. The second century believed the same thing. The third century believed the same thing. You say, well, do we believe the same thing? It's been over 2,000 years. Yeah, we believe the same thing. It could happen in our lifetime. His return could take place today. Therefore, be patient. Be patient. The second thing is, what's the Christian's attitude during patience? Let's be real for just a second. How do we respond during times where we need patience? I don't know how you respond, but I know how I respond. And oftentimes, I do not respond in the best possible means. I am quick to be impatient. I like everything to be done very quickly. If I have to go to a restaurant, I want fast food service, meaning I like the restaurant, but I want the food there quickly. When I do things, I want to receive results from them. Perhaps you're not like that. But James addresses our attitude. 
because it says it's important for us to have an attitude check during times of patience. What's going on? In verse 9, 10 and 11, he says, our attitude exposes our conduct. It is out of the mouth that flows what's really in our heart. From our lips that we see our attitude is first expressed of whether we are patient or impatient. James says in verse 9, do not grumble against one another. It is very easy for us to do to, to grumble and complain, to moan against the fellow Christian. If they do not live up to our expectation, if they don't do exactly what we think they should do, it's easy to say, to point our finger at them and to complain against a fellow servant of the Lord. Can you imagine if there was a Christian Yelp site? Now, some of you don't know what Yelp is, but it's an opportunity that you can get online and you can evaluate a company, a service. But imagine if it was a Christian version of that to where you could log in and put someone's name and leave one, two, three, four stars on your expectation on whether they're doing what's right. That's what James is talking about. So we're not to groan, we're not to mumble, we're not to complain against our fellow brethren. Lest we find ourselves being condemned. When things don't go according to our plans, to our schedule, we do begin to murmur. That's the real life. That's what I preach about James. He doesn't sugarcoat it. He says, guys, this is how it is. Ladies, we do this. The word of God tells us that this is true. This would be like Sarah who's sitting in the tent and, and the Lord comes to her and Abraham and says, you're going to have a son. And she laughs. He says, oh, you laughed when I said that. Oh, I didn't laugh. You laughed. You laughed. I heard you. But you weren't in here. I'm God. James pointing out, says, this is what we do. We do this. We shouldn't do this. Just like the nation of Israel. The nation of Israel, when, remember when they were in the wilderness. Their attitude exposed their conduct, how they behave. But it also exposes their understanding. It shows us what we know. We don't have all the information on a, circumstance, on a situation. We don't understand the circumstance that we, ha that we see before us correctly. We don't understand how God is going to be glorified through the entire thing. The bottom line is we just don't really have the big picture of what's taking place. So why, so why are we going to groan and complain? For the one who does understand that is standing at the door and he's ready to judge correctly. When the nation of Israel was in the wilderness, led by a, a wonderful leader by the name of Moses, he led the pe people faithfully. He delivered them from slavery. And we're not talking years, we're not talking months, we're talking days out of the land. And the people say, hey, Moses, you stink as a leader. We don't have food. We don't have water. We want to go back into slavery because at least we have our basic needs covered. Moses, I'm doing what God told me. Later on, it becomes so severe that his brothers and sisters come and say, Moses, who picked you? God. Well, God also picked us. You aren't any better than us to do the same things. Why can't we do the same thing? All right. The people began to murmur because they didn't like his style. They didn't like that he didn't do things according to their time schedule. They didn't see the big picture. They didn't have all the facts. They didn't understand that God is trying to get them to become dependent, not on Moses, but to be dependent upon him and him alone. So instead of crying out murmuring, they're saying, why don't you cry out and ask God for water, for food, who is so faithful 
so compassionate, so merciful, that he's always willing and, and, and willing to give. And he does so. But that doesn't stop the murmur and complaining. The people didn't understand everything. The people didn't understand that he was going to use a stiff-necked group of people, stubborn people, to reveal to the entire world his glory, his awesomeness. And they missed it. They were too concerned about, but I don't have any of this stuff, and I want... And we want to be like the other nations and we want kings like they have and we don't want God to rule over us. You're not seeing the big picture. You don't have all the facts. You and I, we don't have all the facts. In our lives, in our church, be patient. God is at work doing something. Don't grumble against each other. Instead, there's a couple of attitudes that we are to exemplify. There's some examples for us, for us to follow. James says, here's, who you're, here's some examples for you to look at. First, take a look at the prophets, and then second, look at Job. Verse 10, he says, My brethren, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord as an example of suffering and patience. Indeed, we count them blessed who endure. You have heard... And then he continues on on Job. He takes a group of the prophets as a whole. He doesn't point on one individual. What was the job of the prophet? They had a marvelous job. Like Moses, they got to communicate the word of God to a group of people. How honorable is that? How exciting is that? But you forget the people didn't really want to hear the people didn't say, oh, we've got a prophet in our midst. This is thrilling. We get to hear the word of God. Let's put our chairs in a circle and listen. No. People said, we don't want to hear this. We don't, want it. we don't like your message. It's a bad report. Tell us what we want to hear. Tell us how great we dress. Tell us how wonderful we are. Don't tell us about our sin. And yet the prophets, as we look at them, and we admire them because they stuck to it. They didn't leave and quit. When it got difficult for them, they didn't turn away. They were faithful in carrying out God's message. They were faithful in communicating God's word to a desperate group of people who needed to hear God's word. Is there an application in there for you and me? I think so. I think our area is desperate to hear and to see the love of Christ. So much so, what happened to those prophets? Well, they all served the Lord and they died. But we are reminded of them in Hebrews chapter 11. In Hebrews chapter 11, if you have not read Hebrews 11 in, in some time, I would encourage you to do so because it is the hall of fame of faith. We have a group of people who stood by faith and followed the Lord. And that has been an encouragement to you and I. They did it. They persevered. They had patience. They stuck to the job that was at hand. Like the little train that could, facing the big mountain, says, I think I can, I think I can. And then after he got over the top, he said, I thought I could, I thought I could. But the Christian life is not about positive thoughts. If you go on to chapter 12 in, in, in Hebrews, we are told that we are surrounded by such a great witness a great cloud of witness who are encouraging and saying, you can do this through Christ. You can do this. And as we are marching on in our race, they are there lining the street, cheering us on. And then we have Job. We recall, did Job know what was going on in his life? No, Job didn't have understanding. He didn't know about the supernatural conversation between God and Satan. He didn't know that God said, Oh, Satan, take a look at my servant, Job. There's none as righteous as him. And Satan's going, Yeah, but that's only because you favor him and you give him all those great things. Really? Huh. You can take all that stuff away. He does so. 
Job's kids die. Remember, he had ten kids. Job loses his wealth. Job loses his relationships. Job loses his, his reputation. Satan comes back and says, yeah, but he's got his health. God says, oh, take his health, but leave his life. How many people will, are willing to do just about anything to save their health? Guys, I'm going to pick on you because we tend to be a little squeamish when we get the flu. We need to be babied, cared for, and we think we're going to die, and it's only the flu. Job had boils all over his body. Job was in pain. Job didn't have understanding. He didn't know what was going on. You think at least if he knew the reason for this, he would be able to handle it. There are many times that sickness come our way and we don't have a cause. We don't have a reason why it's happening. And we're left with the unknown. We know of Job's circumstances. He, was a, he had wealth. He had family. And yet, all that was taken away. And we have the record of Job's actions. Job spoke rightly in concerning God's character. Through this entire mess of losing a child, he doesn't cry out and say, Oh God, why me? Of losing all his financial situation. He doesn't cry out and say, God, I've lost everything. Now I have nothing. I'm ruined. Even his wife comes up to him and says, Why don't you just curse God and get it over with? He loses the support of a loved one. His friends come to him and say, Job, we understand why you're in this mess. Oh, please tell me. Because you're a sinner. That's why. And you deserve this. Well, what have I done? What sin have I done? Throughout the entire thing, Job says, God is righteous, holy, and true. I am a man. I don't know everything. Did, Joseph, did Job, Job excuse me, complain? Yes. He was upset because you and I would be upset. But he never talked incorrectly about God. It's not until later on towards the end of the book that God says and speaks of Job, Job spoke well of me. You guys did not. Job is righteous and did what was right. And the Lord had compassion and mercy on him. He had another ten children. His wealth was doubled. His reputation was humongous afterwards. God blessed this man. And James points out and says, no, we know the end of what took place with Job. We have seen this recorded in the word of God. that The Lord is merciful and compassionate. We are called... To patience. Our attitude. What is our attitude during the patience? Last thing, what are we supposed to do with this? What's the application we should have for patience? How do we apply this into our own life? Verse 12 doesn't seem like it really fits. It says, above all, my brethren, do not swear either by heaven or by earth or with any other oath but let your yes be yes and your no be no, lest you fall into judgment. It seems like what, J, what James is saying is needs to go with another verse. Why is he talking about this? Well, if we are to apply patience to our own life, it needs to begin with what comes out of our mouth. Do we speak do we speak the truth? Or are we relying upon some outside factor to prove the truth? James is saying, here's the bottom line. Regardless of the circumstance you find yourself in, make sure that your character reflects honesty, truth in your life. So when someone speaks to you, your yes means yes. Your no means no. Your character that's being revealed 
Does it need to be supported by something else? I don't have to pull out and say, all right, now you're telling me the truth, right? I want you to put your hand and swear by the Bible. No. You said it, therefore, it's to be true. It is difficult during times of trial not just to give in. Don't let your words be flippant. James is talking about when he says, do not swear either by heaven or by earth or by any other oath. Don't just give in and say whatever. Words mean something. Words reflect your walk and your character of the Lord God. Therefore, when you come into a situation, when you're surrounded by individuals and they're seeing you and they're hearing you, your words should match your conduct. And your conduct should be revealed by your words. In the day and age that we live in, that is something that is desperately needed. We need to be known as people of integrity by what we say. For we know the Lord is going to return. Therefore, we don't have to swear by anything else. Our actions and our conduct should cause us to be genuine, to be real. Job said, I, in, I, naked I came into the world, and naked I'll return. The Lord gives and the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Throughout this study in the book of James, James is constantly reminding us, be doers of the word. To be a doer, you've got to be a reader. You've got to put it into practice. And that's been our focus. That continues to be our focus at First Baptist Church. We want to take the word of God and we want to be doers of the word. Therefore, as we find ourselves having to deal with patience in our life, let us put this truth into our life too. Let us be doers and be patient. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you for our time together. We thank you for the book of James. Where patience is an area that each one of us, we know we need to work on, we need to grow in that area. And we know that our patience will be tested within moments of walking out of this building. The further it is we draw away from you, we know that, our, that it seems that the, the larger the test is, May the circumstances that we find ourselves in cause us to come running back to you for strength and encouragement. And let us stand just upon your word and be reminded of the examples that we have before us. In Jesus' name, amen.